Hi everyone, thanks for being here. I'll talk about using Python LXC, which is Linux containers and uh, Linux, to create a mass VM hosting managed by Django and AngularJS. We have a schedule. Part one is my part, backend and architecture, and part two is Oliver's part, this is the front end in Django and AngularJS. Now, first part, backend and architecture. First about me, I am Daniel Kraft from D90, and uh, my Twitter account is WhamDamDam. I am doing computers since 1985, sorry, and I am online since 1987, obviously not in the internet at that time. Who are we? We are creating a service for pre-configured, ready-to-run virtual servers with root for many open source web apps. Think of it like a one-click installer. All this hosted in Germany, by the way, with 100% renewable energy. <laughs> and that's how it looks like. You basically choose some template, like uh, Django in that example, choose a version of it, give it a name, click on add container. Is this viewable? Yes. Um, now you have this container in red because it's uh, off, it's turned off. Then turn it on, then it becomes green, then you click on the URL on the reachable at HTTP, and there's a Django. And here's how it works. We have two parts in this architecture. The back end is called con, uh, short for container management. The front end is called site. This is just our names. Uh, con has two modes. First mode is it could be run, or the, it, it can be run as a daemon. Then it is an XML, XML RPC server. Otherwise, it's an XML RPC client to its own daemon. So basically, you start it as a server, as a daemon first, and then you can um, use it as like a console script which connects to its own XML RPC server. So this is uh, how it looks like if you don't call it as a daemon. Uh, Shell script with, I don't know if you can read that, that's not so important, it's, it's more about these are, this is anything you need to manage virtual machines on a host. You can, um, I can't read it here, I, I have to look there. You can uh, build, I'll show an example uh, shortly. You can remove templates, create containers, duplicate containers, start and stop them and so on. So, con calls itself so it eats its own dog food because it calls its own XML RPC uh, uh, methods, just as like as you'll see shortly as the site does. It can be called by others like the site. It contains anything needed to work with virtual machines. So uh, a very important part is con works completely without site. That means we can use the server part, test it individually, only that we can run it locally, all without any user management or something. This is just a, a virtualization level, a layer. The site, on the other hand, based on Django and AngularJS, calls cons, which can be many, via XML RPC. It does accounting and payment, it creates PDF invoices, it manages user accounts or, and the registration and so on. And also the site works without con. This is also important to test it uh, and to run it locally. Uh, of course, when con doesn't run or isn't available, you won't see any containers. Now back to con. We re-implemented an existing solution for repeatable builds. It looks like that. Maybe someone knows what that is. Yeah, a Docker file, more or less. Um, so we essentially do the same. This is because of the history of con. We first ran on Docker, but Docker didn't have the features we uh, required. So we added the features and had about 80% code on top of Docker and just 20% managing Docker. And we, at some point, we threw away the Docker part and re-implemented the 20% ourselves, and this is part of it. So this is a very, very simple language that um, essentially starts up a LXC container, runs a command inside it like apt-get-update, 
and um, closes that container again. And for the next command, it creates a new snapshot of this template that now was uh, configured with that command and runs, for example, apt-get upgrade dash y. This results in a large template tree because w what you see here is one line is a snapshot of one command you saw earlier. So one, of, uh, one file, we, we actually call it con file, one, of, uh, one line in this file results in one line here in the hierarchy. And the longer lines are the final templates that you can use in Tugub. So Con is using LXC for virtualization, shell in the box for the web console, IP tables for network accounting, all Linux tools. Here are some rules for that, if you didn't know. And it's using a lot of the C group magic from the Linux kernel for accounting, like the CPU ACT group, where the CPU ACT usage counts the nanoseconds per second which are used on the CPU. And the same for the memory, which um, gives RSS active, inactive memory, file memory, caches, and so on. It's using AUFs for storage. This is a layered file system. You can mount uh, any number, nearly any number of uh, yeah, ordinary directories on top of another, and they derive from each other. That means if you have a file A in the lower container and a file B, uh, container, sorry, in the, in the lower directory and a file B in the higher directory, and you mount both, then you see file A and file B. And they do some magic with deleted files and so on. This is a very stable solution. So that leads me to the failures we had. Yes, many. Let's talk about B3FS. We first choose B3FS instead of AUFs because it's fast. It's even fast for millions of files. It works first, it works very good. It has writable snapshot. That means you can at any point use any subvolume in a B3FS, make a snapshot of it and write in both and they diverge. It has live quota with subvolumes. That means you have at any point the disk usage of this subvolume in sum with all the snapshots below it and just the diff, what is the difference to where it was snapshotted from. And it has an instant creation of snapshots. It's like a tenth of a second. But uh, maybe you have seen that. This is the Linux I.O. stack or a diagram of it. Uh, you can basically stack anything in Linux on top of, uh, of another and uh, like, like block devices, then a file system, then a file system image, then a partition inside it and, and, and so on. Without knowing exactly what that does, it's not needed. We did use a device manager for RAID 10. This is on the hard drives, on the physical hard drives. On top we used L LVM. The logical volume manager. On top, we used virt.io. This is the KVM virtual disk I.O. layer. On top, we used a partition. On top of that, for one partition, we used ext4. On top of that, we used an image file, which we uh, mounted as a loopback device and put B3FS on it. This was a test setup because the image file is quite nice for handling and for backup. You can just turn it off, copy the image file somewhere and uh, run it again. However, then the B3FS cleaner died. B3FS is a lazy file system. It, it does what it needs to and cleans up later. That means the B3FS cleaner has to run and it has to clean up later and it died during its job. And we lost data. That's not meant to be. There's a thing in Linux, in the Linux I.O. stack that's called barriers. This is copied from an article on LWN. In a sense, a barrier forbids the writing of any blocks after the barrier until all blocks written before the barrier are committed to the media. That makes sure that the journal of the file system is consistent. Looks like the barrier didn't find its way through these layers. So some point in this stack, obviously, 
after debugging it, didn't work with barriers. So we tried again. The same basic setup, we used the RAID 10, we used LVM on top, we used Virtio with KVM because this is our default setup. We didn't want to throw that away. It helps us very much with backups and uh, things like that. So on top of that, we used the partition and directly a B3FS and hooray, we tried to crash it again, it didn't. So it, the B3FS looked stable from that point. Barrier standing. Well, that's another thing about the B3FS cleaner. It produces a lot of memory fragmentation. If you have never heard about memory fragmentation, yes, it exists, and Linux has a table of it that you will see when you see a kernel traceback in DMESC. And one line of that is a page allocation failure, in that case, order four. The order is the potential of two of the block size in memory that couldn't be allocated. This means that a 64 kilobyte block wasn't available of continuous memory. This is pretty bad because that's not much. And there's no defragmentation tool in the Linux kernel. This is, if you have this state, it will never run again, except there's a memory freeing. Okay, so um, we threw B3FS away and used OFS, which is a bit slower, but much more stable, and we are happy with it. Next failure, XMR PC. <laughs> First, we use Zero PC, a really excellent tool. It is pretty fast, it has a good um, serialization. You can basically just fire off messages, they will arrive somewhere, um, and it's, it's a lot faster than XML RPC. But it was leaking file descriptor when not using gevent, with which we can't because we are currently bound to threats. And uh, then we used XML RPC, but it was very nice. We were a, bit, a little bit, um, uh, yeah, blue-eyed, it's in German. <laughs> we used bytes for anything that was transferred, like for memory usage, for network traffic, for disk space, and so on. But there's a two uh, potential uh, to, the, to the 31 limit of XML RPC, and uh, we couldn't use bytes anymore, so we had to serialize all large numbers to strings or moved to megabytes where, where possible. So it's running for now until we hit the four gigabyte limit again and have problems with megabytes too. Okay, that's it for my part. I would have a lot more failures, but uh, time's running and uh, I'll give over to Oliver. For questions, I'll be there directly after his part. Hi, I'm here uh, working at the front end of Tuboop. Uh, my name is Oliver Rock. Um, I choose Django and AngularJS to get the web UI uh, started pretty much fast. Uh, I use Django for user accounting invoicing management and as a mediator from uh, Daniel's XML RPC API to a JSON API, I can uh, digest with AngularJS. First of all, uh, Django is using CSRF protection for a lot of use if you uh, activate the middleware. So we have to tell AngularJS to take the token from the cookie and send it to every asynchronous request. Uh, the next problem, AngularJS templates will collide with your Django, uh, Django template language because they all use uh, the double curly braces. So we have to tell Angular to use uh, for example, a um, curly brace and a dollar sign. Internationalization, Django uses PO files, which pretty much like SOAP or Plown does, um, to have a consistent state between the Django views and the JavaScript views, you can use the um, um, Django views i18n JavaScript catalog, which takes the PO files and uh, generates a JavaScript you can include into your site and you have a function like get text to have internationalization. You wouldn't use document write in AngularJS, it's just for example. Um, the next um, 
we have a lot of requests depending on, on user permissions, so we have to include a permission denied exception that is delivered by Django, but uh, a standard HTTP service by AngularJS doesn't handle a 403, so you have to create a custom interceptor for that. So we have a factory permission denied interceptor. You can handle uh, a request, request error, response, and response error. In this case, it's a response error, 403, so we uh, set the location to a slash. It's the front page and the registration login page. Another good product is the double entry bookkeeping. It's Django account balances. You have full audit trail. You have always a debit entry and a credit entry or credit entry to debit entry. So you won't lose any money. It's pretty simple. You have to define a source. It's our bank account, the destination account, the user, the amount, uh, and the user that is privileged to transfer the money. The most important thing is uh, keeping the DOM. On the front page of Tuwoop, you have a list of your containers running that is updated every two or three seconds. If you miss to track by an ID, uh, AngularJS will replace the whole DOM every two or three seconds. So you won't be able to interact with all your containers because just in a click, all DOM is gone and replaced by another one. Yeah, it's all pretty much simple, but it's due to the fact that Django and Angular are simple to program. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, any questions, come to the microphones and uh, we'll ask you in turn. So let's start with this chap here. Uh, what kind of version of B3FS you used for tests? Sorry, what, what version did you use for B3FS tests? We were starting with what Ubuntu, Ubuntu 13.10 and were testing it again on 14.04. On I think it's one point something in, in the latest version, uh, where the B3FS cleaner also did these uh, memory fragmentation things. Um, I might be totally the wrong person to ask this, but uh, so if you're using JSON uh, for the front end, why use XML RPC in the back end? It was a mm, decision for development speed. The XML RPC module in Python is well tested and really complete. And you, all you have to do is, um, I don't know, derive, I think, from the uh, XML RPC class. And uh, it makes the server automatically. You, you, you have no effort with it. You just define methods that can be called from outside. This is just for development simplicity. So you switch away from Docker because some features were missing. Docker is like, still in current development, and do you think they will catch up with the features you need like soon? And um, it, it wasn't just about features. It was uh, inconsistency, too. There were um, a lot of um, accounting things that Docker um, returned when, when, when calling it that were uh, inconsistent in itself. And uh, we, we had to work around that. I, I don't exactly remember what that was. And uh, we had all, to do all the C groups magic I was uh, shortly talking about ourselves and much more. And uh, we included all that and uh, accounting, network accounting, like the IP table stuff and so on, completely into our own product. And uh, that was the most code of it. The, the pure LXC virtualization isn't much. I think Docker is improving on monitoring and instrumentation. And another question, do, do you have now, so you have Django and Angular. Is Sorry? Your, so the other guy. Uh, uh, you have now Django and Ang Angular. Um, is your site, does it support like progressive enhancement or um, how, 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 does it, how do you handle that? Like if you go to a di URL directly, is that, is that working? Sorry, I didn't get it. Progressive enhancement, do you use it? What's that? Um, <laughs> so, so when you load your site and then you don't expect any JavaScript uh, to, to be running and the site still works or like non-client rendering. No, no. Okay. We've got lots of time for questions, so come up to the microphone. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. If, uh, is your format, uh, contain, container format compatible with the Docker one? Because uh, 
um, if you um, made a so-called uh, fork of Docker, and if I want to use your uh, your um, hosting infrastructure and uh, didn't want to, you know, vendor lock-in, uh, can I move to the Docker uh, hub or something? So you, your question is if if we have a compatible um, layout of directories? Yes. No, yes. we don't. You you could manually copy the things around, and I think it it would work and write some configuration files for Docker for mm -hmm. each container, but um, we, you, you can't use it directly in Docker. Okay. okay. Do you do any kind of uh, network isolation between containers of the same customer, and how do you do that? We have a network isolation. All containers have uh, private IP addresses, and we only forward um, configured ports for each container that you can configure yourself. So it's a, like a web firewall management thing. Um, but we don't support private networks right now between containers. We are here to learn and we already implemented a few things we heard from people uh, talking about uh, downstairs. But, uh, and, one, and one of these things is private networking. We had a reasonable use case. We heard a reasonable use case for it now because our aim isn't to orchestrate applications together but to, to have one container that contains anything you need like a Postgres and a Django and whatever. Um, but we have now a good use case where a private networking is needed and I think it'll come in a short time. Uh, hey, uh, congratulations on a really cool project and um, uh, do you have any plans for an API at the moment? Do you have, can I, can I script those, these containers? Not yet very beautiful. You can inspect what uh, the site does with, uh, this, uh, with the browser and use that, but it's still based on session cookie and, and stuff like that. You can, of course, use that, but we are on making that a lot more beautiful and documented, especially. <laughs> yes. How long did it take to reach this point? We started in August last year. Yeah. I think that's it. Okay, any final questions? We have got time, if anyone has a final question. Otherwise, put your hands together and thank uh, Daniel and Oliver for a very interesting talk. Thank you. <laughs>